Hello, Darken and Demigods. My name is TVS Guy, and welcome back to Diablo. Now, I was actually recording for, I think, a good half hour previously before I realized that my recording software had, for whatever reason, decided to not be recording anymore. And I don't know why that happened exactly, but it means we lost out on a lot of discussion um, about why the hell I'm doing this little series of videos in the first place, besides just wanting to fill out a bit of time while I am off at a convention, and I don't want YouTube to punish me too badly for going away. But trying to think back to what I was actually talking about uh, in that recording that didn't happen, I talked a lot about intimacy. And what intimacy means to a Diablo game for me. Because in Diablo 1, the scale of the conflict is so very small. Really, everything that happens in this game is very small. It's what this one little town. You're this one adventurer. And it's this one story about this one very specific trauma, this very specific tragedy. And the thing is, in Diablo 2, the intimacy is already gone. I'm can't really remember if I talked a lot about that in the first episode, because now with much of the recording of the previous one lost, I'm unsure what I've talked about already. In Diablo 2, the intimacy of this first game is lost. In the first game, it's just you, this town, that cathedral, and one very specific story about a king driven mad, an evil advisor, and a poor child who was murdered to facilitate the ambitions of another. Hey, let's look at the waypoint. Nice. And that's the thing. I don't remember what Diablo 3 is about. I don't think Diablo 3 is really about anything. Um, from a story perspective, like the narrative of Diablo 3, what's, what's, what's it about? And I don't mean what's it about as in what happens in the story. I can remember in broad strokes what happens in the story. I remember that, you know, you go and rescue Cain, you go and rescue Tyrael, and oh my god, he's an angel from the high heavens, but now he's human because he disagreed with the other angels and some stuff. Um, and you find Cain, and Cain is like, oh, I'm very old, I'm gonna die. And then Cain dies, and that's sad, and then you go to, you know, the desert town with Leia, and... Uh, something happens and there's like these these side characters like the Templar who's got this whole thing about how he's mind controlled and he's very angry that he got mind controlled and he has to come to terms with his being mind controlled by the Templars and how the Templars are actually bad and there's this scoundrel rogue dude who has a sad backstory about like a girl and his brother and some stuff and there's this enchantress who was put into cryostasis, essentially, by a sorcerer a long time ago because of some prophecies and some stuff, but the thing is, how does any of that fit together? Like, what's what's the story there? What's, like, the thing that, because the thing that essentially happens in Diablo 3 is Leia turns into Diablo and then you kill her. Like, in, in very broad strokes, that's the, that's the plot of the story is that you had this friend that turned into Diablo and then you have to kill her. Or else she'll eat heaven. And Leia's character arc in particular is kind of egregious to me in that game because it makes no sense what she doesn't have one. Like she goes from being like, oh, uh, oh, I thought I was an ordinary girl, but I guess I'm a. Sp and she turns out she, she was like a really special girl, and her mother is evil, and she was the son of the original adventure from Diablo 1, although what that connection means is never really made clear, and then she turns into Diablo because Diablo she's sad, and also because her mother is a dick. And there's no... I don't know what the fuck the theme of Diablo 3 is. Because I don't think it has one. I don't think Diablo 3 has any theme at all. I don't think it's about anything, really. It's just a story that's going through set pieces, like, it, or not set pieces so much, it's going through tropes, essentially, like, it's going through the outline of what a typical epic fantasy story might look like, because 
And with, with twists and turns and... Uh-oh, I might die. If I get surrounded too much. Thank God they're cowards. Still. Um... It goes through twists and turns, and there's a character you thought they were good, but they were evil, and there's a there's the beloved character that everybody likes, and they kill him off to show that they're really serious, y'all. This is a serious story that has serious stakes. And then there's, like, the angel dude who's grappling with his responsibility or something. And then there's the high heavens, which, like, of course, they're heaven, and they're that, that means they're good, and they're full of order, but, oh, they're also morally inflexible and bad, except... Which doesn't really mean anything because they're never contrasted against the idea that hell might then represent radical freedom and all the horror that comes with radical freedom. And that, if that was the idea that to, to contrast heaven and hell by making heaven full of these stodgy old angels who have their rules and stuff, and if you don't follow the rules, then you get thrown out and Tyrael is like, that's unjust. And that's his emotional arc, except hell doesn't provide any kind of a contrast to it. And Leia certainly doesn't either. And she should be the one who, like, she's the one who turns into Diablo. So surely she should have some kind of narrative arc that embodies that conflict between having this power and wanting to apply it to do whatever she wants to seek her own justice in the world or to take revenge for something, which again is never really a part of her characterization at all. And all of this is couched in all of these fucking prophecies, all of these prophecies, all of these ancient dead peoples, all of these ancient tombs and... You know, the whole thing about the Nephilim and, like, not only is Leia this special prophecy chosen one, except in a bad way because she's going to turn into Diablo, you're also a special prophecy chosen one because you are the Nephilim, and you're like a half-angel demon thing or something like that. I don't even remember what the fucking Nephilim is. And the story is never really... There's never really any exploration of that in terms of, like, your character, because even though your character in this game finally gets to have some goddamn voice lines... Oh, this could be bad. I hate ranged attackers. Just get rid of the elite, then kill the minions. Yes. There's a lot of attrition in the original Diablo, which again ties in a lot with, with some of the themes of the game itself. Because Diablo 3's story is so huge and so sprawling and so fucking all over the place, like, it wants to do all of the things. It wants to do, like, the, the tragedy of Leia who turns into, you know, this, the, who turns into Diablo and you can, yeah, you're supposed to feel the loss of this young, vibrant, good young woman who gets taken over by this evil corrupting force. And that's like standard horror movie fare. That's like your Carrie thing. Except in Carrie, the possession means, like, the, the the mystical powers and the evil and the murder means something. They happen in response to things that happen to her in the story as a person, to the kind of home life that she has. It's a metaphorical expression of her trauma, essentially, which, again, not part of the story of Diablo 3 at all. Like, Where would I put this? how Leia feels about her transformation into Diablo just doesn't come up ever in the game. It's not relevant, it's not interesting or important to the game. Which is why it doesn't matter when she becomes Diablo. Like, it really, it doesn't matter, it doesn't change anything. It just means that she's the one who's the monster you have to click on until it dies. It doesn't change anything about the narrative of the story. And here in this game, the identity of Diablo is actually kind of fucking important because this entire tragedy gets kicked off because Lazarus enters a pact with Diablo for power. He's corrupted or whatever may be happening. And he uses Albrecht, the king's son, as the vessel for Diablo. And so the, the son essentially becomes kind of a recipient for all the sins of the town. Like, Diablo is the source of all the misery in this town. The direct source. Kill Diablo and destroy the source of misery in this town. The, the, the thing that has caused all of the pain, all of the misery, all of the suffering, all of everything that happens in this game, all of all the stuff you're trying to deal with and, and push back against, all of it comes from that one moment when... Lazarus, betray Lazarus betrays the town to Diablo. All of it ties back to him, his ambition, his greed for power, for wealth, for status, whatever it was. All of it ties back to King Leoric 
being a good man who's morally compromised by his, his emotional attachments. All of it ties back to these inciting incidents, and they are what you're trying to solve. Like, there is an inciting incident here, which is something that, again, <clears throat> in, the, in Diablo 3, I can't identify one. What is the inciting incident in Diablo 3? Is, is, is it the death of Cain? No, because, like, your character has already decided to go on the quest, and each character gets their own backstory and, like, their own motivations for why they, they went out. Like, the Barbarian has a different one from the from the Templar or the Crusader, who has a different one from the Necromancer and blah, blah, blah. But none of it matters to the story because, like, they try to inject these different character motivations for the player character, and that just goes so disastrously wrong because... On the one hand, they want to do the thing where each character now has voice lines and they have like a personality and they have a, a backstory and a history. But on the other hand, nothing about your character's backstory, nothing about their motivations, nothing about where they came from or why they're doing what they're doing changes anything about what happens in the story. It doesn't alter, it doesn't recontextualize anything that happens. It doesn't change what you have to do. And it doesn't do that in Diablo 1 either, but in Diablo 1, that's kind of woven into the story. Like, that's kind of that's kind of part of the point, is that the rogue, the warrior, and the sorcerer all arrive in the town with the same goal. Like, the sorcerer is there for research, essentially. He wants to do research on the soul stones and on the monsters that live in the cathedral and find out what's going on there. So that's his driving motivation for continuing through. And then he gets wrapped up in the plot about Albrecht and all that. The warrior is just a dude who used to live in Tristram and he happens to be a mercenary, so he's just there like, fuck, like my hometown is under attack, I better save it. And the rogue, I can't quite remember from the manual specifically why the rogue is there, but it's something similar. Like, it's just that they have reasons for wanting to investigate the cathedral, all of them. That naturally lead them into wanting to explore this dark space. And all of their motivations are tied to the physical location of the cathedral and to and to to the events that happen in Tristram specifically. And that's sort of that's sort of the same premise that you start Diablo 3 with, because everybody comes to investigate the falling star, basically. But then it's like after they have investigated the falling star, <clears throat> why wh why wh why are they still there? Like, why are they still going to fight Diablo? Why are, they, why are they still on that particular quest? It's really tenuous of why, like, why, oh, hey, do you want to go globetrotting with us to fight Satan? Why anyone would do that? It's like, uh, because there is no... You don't get to spend a lot of time in each area, really. And you don't really get to know... Um, a lot of the people in the towns and the villages and the places that you go to because you spend like 99% of your time out fighting and exploring and doing quest things out in the wilderness and you only ever come back to town in order to sell stuff and change your equipment and then you're back out into the wilderness. And, like, that limited interaction is still here in, in Diablo 1. Like, it's not like you, you, you go back to town to do anything other than sell stuff over the course of normal gameplay, but Hello, you always go back to the same people. It's always the same people over and over again. So you get to develop some kind of relationship with them. There is, like, there's a point to talking to them and hearing them out and listening to what they have to say and checking out the gossip and talking to every character every time you're back in town because sometimes some of them have some insight into some of your quests that can tell you something about how to deal with a particularly dif difficult enemy or find a particular thing. And sometimes they're just kind of funny and interesting to listen to. And because you are forced to spend the entire game with only this set of characters, even though you don't engage very deeply with any one of them, you're still forced to develop a relationship to them. You're still forced to remember what their voices sound like. I sense a soul in search of answers. Well, what can I do for you? <clears throat> and what ails you, my friend? Pepin the Healer. I can remember these always. I can't remember what fucking anyone in Diablo 3 sounds like. And I've played like 40 hours of that damn game, but I can't... I can barely remember what Leia's voice sounds like. I remember what Cain sounds like because I've listened to him for three games now, but... The intimacy was lost. 
That's the thing I'm trying to get at, I guess. The intimacy that informed this early game was lost. And I know that a lot of that comes from technical limitation. Like, I know a lot of that comes from just... They didn't have the tech to... And, and the budget to do a bigger game than this. And the, indeed, they didn't want to pack it onto 15 CDs. <clears throat> in order to fit it on a computer system. Sure, but... This game is about something. Diablo, like, it's really... Diablo 1 is really, on a fundamental level, a lot about trauma. And sorrow, and... To a certain extent, depression, and how you deal with it. Because terrible things happen to King Leoric, and his grief becomes this curse that infects the entirety of Tristram, and everyone in Tristram, like, everybody is sad all of the time. In Tristram. All of the time. Nobody's ever happy in this game. There's there's really there's very little happiness. Like Griswold is jovial occasionally, but you can also tell he's really heart bitten and kind of like ugh tired of everything. Adria is mysterious and inscrutable, but also just kind of nasty <laughs> in a lot of ways. And Wirt, Wirt especially, who became kind of an iconic character because he was essentially the gambler character in the original, like the character that you went to in order to have a random chance at a good item or a lot of money. Is this traumatized kid who's trying to play it tough and who's trying to, to, to grow up way too fast because of what happened to him in the labyrinth, because of, because of what, what, because of the trauma that he went through. And it's the same thing with Farnham, Farnham the Drunk, who is this this completely ravaged, wrecked old man who's been completely driven over the edge by the things he has seen in the labyrinth. And you can see what I mean here. Like, this is the kind of shit that's happened to this town. Just really awful things. And all of it comes back to, to poor Albrecht. Albrecht, his death is the inciting incident that sets all of this off. His death is what brings all of this pain and misery and sorrow down on Tristram and the townsfolk that live there. His, his, his death and his suffering are the inciting incidents for the game. And so when you end the game and you kill Diablo, you find that Diablo was Albrecht all along. Poor Albrecht's body was being used as the host to the prime evil of terror. And there's, there's a thematic cohesion to that that in finally laying the poor boy to rest, this ghost that has been haunting everyone and everything in the entire time, and even when you get down to hell, like the hell levels, first of all, the hell levels are not, they don't look like the burning hells of Diablo 2 or Diablo 3. They look like an underground perversion of the cathedral, like the cathedral that we're in right now, they look like a satanic version of that. And that's the thing, and I'm not going to fight the Butcher right now because I do not have the equipment for it, or indeed the level. It's a satanic version of that. You're essentially going full circle back to the church in which you started. Back into the, into the, into the halls of power, as it were, of Westmarch, and you're confronting this evil where it lives. And it is surrounded, Albrecht, as, as Diablo, when you fight him, he's surrounded by Hell Knights. I can't remember if that's exactly what they're called, but he's surrounded by knight characters. And a lot of the enemies you fight in Hell are essentially versions, like there's succubuses, which are these sort of sexy seductresses, which is a, ref a reflection of Lazarus, like who was seduced by the power of Hell. Oh, hey, I got an email. Um, and then there's the Hell Knights, who are representatives of the king, the king's power, like Danon, the father, uh, uh, you know, King, king Leoric, the father of Albrecht, and the man whose grief started this whole miserable affair. You have these dual representations of the authors of the misery that has afflicted Tristram and its townsfolk. And you have to fight your way through those, through succubuses and hell knights and stuff, in order to get to Diablo, who again, remember, is Albrecht, who has, at least that's the way I read it, who is, who is reflecting his childish experiences into the minions that he creates for himself as Diablo. 
you know, you're fighting the power of temptation, the, the temptation of power that makes people do terrible things, which is what got Lazarus in the end. And you're fighting against those representations of institutional power, the king and his knights, who are, of course, the people who brought down such horror on the town by murdering everybody, by, go by going insane, by tearing themselves apart. It's not... It's not Silent Hill 2 levels of psychological quality, but there is a thematic cohesion. There's a unity of themes between the enemies that you're fighting and the locations that you're fighting them in. Like, you're literally, again, you are descending deeper and deeper into the into the, the cathedral, and as you do so, you also descend deeper and deeper into the madness that is affecting Tristram. Right, you're, you're descending deeper and deeper into, literally deeper into the underlying issues that lie at the heart of the town's suffering. And at the very heart of it, at the very depths of the town's suffering, you find poor Albrecht. That poor kid who was taken by circumstance, essentially. Who was turned into a pawn in someone else's game of power and used as a means to torture his own father. And it's only once you lay the ghost of Albrecht to rest, Diablo, this terrible haunting that has befallen Tristram. That's 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 when you restore peace to the world, except when you kill Diablo, you find that he can't be destroyed. He's this soul stone thing. That even though you have you have dealt with the inciting incident, even though you've dealt with the host of Diablo, Albrecht, even though you have laid that poor child to rest. The torment, the terror that he generated, like the, the misery, the horror that came from Albrecht's death is not so easy to get rid of. And you there, having delved into the darkest, deepest bottom of misery and the darkest, deepest bottom of all of the issues that affect this town and affect this world... The only way that you can think of your the only way your character can think of to deal with it is to pound the soul stone into their own heads and become Diablo's new vessel. You reach the bottom and you don't kill Diablo in a spate of triumph and yes, I have overcome the trauma. I have overcome the pain. I've overcome the misery. I've freed everyone from it. The best you could possibly do when you finally get there is to take the trauma on yourself. To absorb all of it and make yourself a scapegoat for all the miseries of Tristram and all the sins of its king and its miserable archbishop and all the greed and all the poison that has been infecting this town. You just become another vessel for it. Because having delved so deep into trauma and misery, there's no coming back. There's no coming out of that the same person you were going in. You are literally transformed by the experience. Like the classic hero's journey, except rather than being transformed into something better, you're corrupted into something much worse. As indeed, Diablo 2 begins to explore as we find that the original adventure from Diablo 1 has become the Dark Wanderer and is once again spreading evil across the world. And in that sense, there was a nice thematic cohesion between Diablo 1 and Diablo 2, but the intimacy, like the smallness of this premise, it's just, it's a grieving father and his dead son at the heart of all of this. One tragedy tearing an entire community apart in very, very horrifyingly literal ways. That's not there in Diablo 2, because you're globetrotting, you're traveling all over the world, and there is no <clears throat> original sin for you to be fighting against. There is no inciting incident, there is no anything, there's just, you know, a whole bunch of demons that need to be killed and clicked on until they die, and a lot of loot that needs to get picked up, and a lot of skill points that need to be acquired, and a lot of... Yeah. The intimacy disappeared. And I think I'm going to cut this episode there. So if you've enjoyed this, if you're enjoying this little 
rambly retrospective of videos on the original Diablo and what that game meant to me, well, you should feel free to hit the like button down below. Uh, and if you want to hit the dislike button on this one, I think it's fine because this is kind of filler content just to kind of fill out some time slots so YouTube doesn't punish me for being away for too long. Um, and you can also like subscribe to the channel and do the thing and do the stuff and all of this stuff that I've been talking about here, all of these thoughts that I'm kind of vomiting out into the world, Hopefully, eventually, I'm going to turn them into a serious video essay, kind of looking back at the Diablo franchise and sort of charting what happened to it over time. All of that, though, that is for a later date. And for now, I'm just going to tell you thank you very much for watching, and I shall see you in the next episode of this little mini-series.